Good afternoon and welcome to the Recover Research Review or R3 seminar. My name is Beth Linus and I'm an infectious disease epidemiologist with the Recover Administrative Coordinating Center and the moderator of today's seminar. The goal of this seminar series is to catalyze a shared understanding of the research within the Recover Consortium. I wanna start by thanking everyone who submitted questions in advance. Please submit any questions that arise during today's presentation using the Q&A feature in Zoom. After the presentation, we will answer many questions, as many questions as possible. A Q&A document will be posted with the recording of the seminar on recovercovid.org. It will include the answers for submitted questions relevant to today's presentation. Questions about other scientific topics will be addressed in future seminars and answers to broader questions about recover will be available in the FAQs at recovercovid.org. And as a reminder, we cannot answer individual questions about clinical care. The topic of today's seminar is Patterns and Prevention of Long COVID, Findings from Recover EHR Cohort Studies. Our presenters today are Dr. Young Kang Zhang, Dr. Hania Razaghi, and, and our discussant is Dr. Ravi Javari. Dr. Young Kang Zhang is an assistant professor in the Par Department of Population Health Sciences at Weill Cornell Medical College. His research uses large-scale healthcare data, data to understand patient health system and social characteristics associated with healthcare utilization, quality, and outcomes, with a special focus on racial ethnic minority patients and socially vulnerable patients. Dr. Zhang is one of the core investigators in epidemiology slash health services research component of the PCORNet EHR Hub under the Recover Initiative. Dr. Hania Razaghi is the Director of Analytics for the Data Coordinating Center for PizzaNet, where she leads work on data integration, advanced data quality assessment, and clinical analytics. Her primary research interest is in secondary use of clinical data to better define health status in children and to improve the quality of health care. Her research focuses on data quality assessment that accounts for the analytic uses of data and on effective methods for automated phenotyping and analytics in large data sets. And Dr. Ravi Javari, is division head for pediatric infectious diseases at the Ann and Robert H. Lurie Children's Hospital in Chicago and professor of pediatrics at the Northwestern University Feinberg School of Medicine. Dr. Javari's research spans many aspects of hepatitis C virus with particular focus on the burden, clinical outcomes and treatment of HCV in infants, children and pregnant women. He currently serves on the AASLD IDSA HCV guidelines panel as well as the AASLD Viral Hepatitis Elimination Task Force. Dr. Javari is a fellow of the Infectious Diseases Society of America and currently serves as, a, as the chair of the IDSA Standards and Practice Guidelines Committee. Today's speakers will, will share our current understanding, the gaps in our knowledge, and how Recover will contribute to filling these knowledge gaps. And with that, I will turn it over to Dr. Javari. Uh, thanks doc, uh, very much, Dr. Linus. I really appreciate uh, being here and being with all of you. Thanks for being here. Um, my, I wanted to just start with a very brief introduction. So many of you who are familiar with the Recover Initiative know that uh, there are many aspects to this project, uh, and that relates to uh, uh, direct clinical studies. Uh, the analysis of existing clinical data, as well as the collection of samples uh, that are available on patients with uh, COVID and post-COVID uh, conditions. Uh, the theme of our two uh, topics and papers being discussed today really focus on that second bullet point, which is the EHR-related studies that are being scrutinized as part of Recover. And so really we'll be focused on that EHR and real world data that's available to look at the impact of COVID and the development risk factors or potential impact of vaccine and treatment on post-COVID conditions. Uh, so with that as a brief introduction, um, I'm gonna uh, hand it over to Dr. Zhang, who's gonna take us through our first uh, presentation. Thank you so much, Dr. Jivari. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for the opportunity to present uh, results from a newly published paper about PASC among children and adults. Uh, so my name is Yung Kanjan, and I'm an assistant professor at the World Corner Medical College or World Corner Medicine. In this, in this study, we looked at, uh, uh, we compared the select symptoms and the conditions 31 to 150 days after uh, a COVID-19 testing between those who were tested positive versus negative among both children and adults. Next, please. 
Um, so as Dr. Jawari has discussed, this study is part of the NIH Recovery Initiative. And uh, I'm from the one of the three EHR sites where we are using large scale EHR data to generate uh, high quality real world evidence to understand uh, uh, what are the uh, leading symptoms and the conditions among people who are tested positive of uh, COVID-19 uh, uh, path condition symptoms. Next, please. So our team leveraged the very comprehensive and high quality EHR data from PCORNET, the Patient Centered Outcome Research Network. Uh, we received the data from more than 40 health systems in a standardized PCORNET format. Uh, I mean, this number of health systems vary. So uh, in the beginning, we used a few, but uh, as time goes by, we have uh, much more data from a lot of health systems to study uh, past or long COVID. Uh, the data from this hospital, uh, from these health systems uh, uh, we'll be going through some necessary steps such as extraction, transformation to make them research, uh, rather, re to make them rather available for researchers. And with this comprehensive data, we have been uh, doing a lot of activities such as verbalization, query, cohort identification to support a trial, for example, and more importantly, to generate real world evidence to improve our understanding of past or long COVID conditions among children and adults. Next, please. Uh, our team has four key components. Um, in the machine learning AI component, uh, they have been using advanced machine learning methods to identify symptoms and the conditions that can be considered as PASC. Um, so uh, as a member of the epidemiology HSR team, we are leveraging the output from the AI machine learning team to understand uh, if there's any racial, ethnic, socioeconomic, uh, or geographic disparities in PASC. And we also understand uh, if there's any exacerbation of pre-existing conditions following a positive COVID-19 testing. We also have two other components led by physicians and other colleagues. Uh, they have been doing important work uh, in terms of defining PASC uh, based on clinical uh, expertise and conducting query to identify all kinds of potential past conditions and symptoms. Next, please. So the study I'm presenting today, uh, it's a newly published study in BMC infectious disease. Uh, as I discussed earlier, we compared the select symptoms and the conditions between 31 to 150 days after testing between those who were, who were tested positive versus negative among children and adults. Um, next, please. So this study, uh, we started this research project in uh, 2021. Um, so a lot of things motivated the research of, of this project probably has been changed. Uh, but uh, when, when we planned the study, uh, what do we know, what, do, what do we knew by that time was like uh, many study reported uh, the, the significant proportion of people who infected with SARS-CoV-2 developed new and persistent condition symptoms, uh, which we call PASC or lung COVID. The incidence varied among literature. So because of variation in definition of PASC, um, the data source and how PASC was measured. But generally speaking, the literature by that time reported like 10 to 50% of COVID-19 patients develop past condition symptoms. And this past condition symptoms affected a wider range of organ systems. So pretty much each part of your body will be infected by COVID-19 infection. And uh, we also observed uh, certain patient groups such as older adults and those who were hospitalized uh, because of COVID, they have a higher incidence of PASC. Um, so there, are, there were few large-scale population-based studies we, we, we identified back to two years or two years or three years ago. But uh, um, those large-scale population studies, they focused on a very specific population, such as Medicare beneficiaries using Medicare claims data, um, and also a lot of evidence from U.S. veterans generated by a very productive team. But the U.S. veterans, as, as we know, they, are, they have very specific demographics and health conditions, which may not be generalizable to the overall population. Next, please. In the meantime, there were fewer generalizable population studies, like looking at general adults. These studies had some significant limitations. For example, 
Um, if you look at the studies published uh, in 2021, 2022, most of them focused on hospitalized COVID-19 patients, and many of them did not use a control group, which means that we, we, we just did not, we don't know if those past conditions can be identified by the study, or is it like more uh, prevalent among COVID-19 positive patients, or they have similar rate, we don't know. And uh, many of them examined the task uh, of a single organ system, like respiratory, or some other organ system, and or patients from specific region. And uh, more importantly, we found that those studies probably uh, failed to address for some potential confounders uh, between COVID-19 infection and the PASC. Um, also, uh, after reviewing the literature, we realized that overall, there was not, not a lot of evidence about the PASC among children and non-hospitalized adults. So that's the, uh, those, those are the motivations for us to start this project uh, back to uh, 20, 2021, 2022. Next, please. So in this study, we aim to use EHR data from PCORNET to examine if select symptoms and conditions were associated with SARS-CoV-2 infection among adults and children compared to a control group of people who never had a positive test. So uh, by select symptoms and conditions, um, I mean, so this study is a follow-up study after an earlier study. So the team had a JAMA net Network Open publication uh, which was a more descriptive analysis, and they compared a more comprehensive of conditions and symptoms that are, that are potential tasks. And after that study, uh, the team identified uh, a slack number of symptoms and conditions that were more prevalent among COVID-19 positive patients. But that study did not do a lot of adjustment. So that's led to this study. So we leveraged the output from a prior study to uh, to understand uh, uh, what would happen if we do a more rigorous adjustment using regression-based uh, analysis. Next, please. So this study used uh, EHR data from 43 people and sites, and those sites participated in a CDC-funded surveillance program. Starting in April 2020, those health systems refresh their data analysts monthly for patients who received the care from their affiliated hospitals and clinics. So those patients included uh, anyone who had a documented uh, SARS-CoV-2 laboratory test, regardless of results. So we included both positive and negative tests. And also uh, anyone had a SD10 diagnosis for respiratory disease that may in, uh, that may or may that it may in Indicate that not limited to COVID nineteen or medication use or some other uh, treatment uh, for COVID nineteen infection. So we included a lot of people from these health systems. Next, please. Um. So we for to be included in the study, we require that all patients should have a SARS CoV two laboratory test between March first, twenty twenty, and May thirty first, twenty twenty one. Um, because we are looking at uh, what happened after a person was tested positive. So first we have we have to know what happened to them before uh, the COVID-19 testing. So that's why we required uh, first uh, everyone should have at least one encounter uh, in about 31 to 6 uh, to 18 months. So 31 day to 18 months before their index date, which was defined as their first positive or negative uh, testing date. So this baseline period was used to screen what kind of conditions and symptoms each person had before their COVID-19 testing. To understand what happened after a positive or negative testing, we additionally require each person to have uh, an encounter in the period, the 31 to 150 days after their index date, after their first positive negative negative date. So we included two cohorts for our children or adolescents cohort. Uh, each person uh, was aged between zero to 19 by the time of their testing. And the rest of people who aged over 20 years or older are included in the adult cohort. And uh, in both cohorts, we first categorized them based on if they were hospitalized following a COVID-19 testing. Next, please. For symptoms, 
Uh, so we have we examine a lot of symptom outcomes. I mean, there are a lot of symptoms could be considered as PASC. So we have like a list of 14 or uh, maybe a little bit more symptom conditions such as headache, shortness of breath, fatigue. Uh, so based on the symptoms, we generate the four outcomes. First, it's at least one symptom, which required at least one, only one ICD-10 code for the symptom outcomes. Um, we also look at the three or more symptoms, which includes and list three ICD-10 codes for the same or different symptoms. We also looked at the two separate symptoms because they are they have been widely reported as potential paths, including fatigue and shortness of breath. So we have four symptom outcomes. Next, please. For condition outcomes, we looked at a very comprehensive list of conditions, such as including mental health conditions, include uh, for example, anxiety or depression chronic kidney disorders, diabetes, either type 1 or type 2, uh, hematologic disorders, major cardiovascular events, neurological disorders, uh, and respiratory disease. So this, each, each condition was examined separately as different outcome. Next, please. So the key exposure variable is the testing result of uh, uh, of the laboratory test for COVID-19. So we have the positive group based on the results, including like positive, presumably positive or detected. And the people who were defined as negative, so their results are negative or not detected. So the positive group include anyone who had at least one positive test. A negative group include the people who never had a positive test or diagnosis for COVID-19. So we define the index date uh, as their first positive or negative test date. Next, please. Um, so we controlled for a lot of uh, potential confounders or covariates in analysis for both age cohorts. Uh, we controlled for age, age squared, to account for potential nonlinear relationship. We also controlled for their sex, race, ethnicity, and the weight class. Uh, we have different cutoff for adults and the children. And also we controlled for number of encounters in the health system uh, in the baseline before the index date. Next, please. Uh, for adults, because adults have much more commonly health conditions than children, so we additionally controlled for uh, a combined comorbidity score based on diagnosis and in the baseline, and we controlled for their smoking status, like including current smoker, never smoke, former or missing smoking status. Uh, for hospitalized people, because hospital people have uh, very complicated conditions, severe conditions, we also control the four, some variables that could represent the severity of their conditions during hospitalization, including length of hospital stay, medication use, and the mentality of ventilation during hospitalization. Next, please. So in terms of analysis, first of all, adults, uh, we examined the uh, all the seven condition outcomes I just discussed uh, in different, each condition has the, has their own model. So we examine it separately. So we use the Cox model, Cox proportional hazard model to do the time to invent analysis, accounting for the time from the beginning of the post-acute period to the earliest documentation of the first diagnosis for each condition uh, until the end of the outcome period. Uh, we control the four all the covariates I just described in these models. So for condition outcomes, we, we look at the new conditions, which means that uh, this person to be included in the mental health outcome, this person should not have any re relevant diagnosis in the baseline. So we only count for we, we only identify the people who newly diagnosed, newly developed uh, each of the conditions following their uh, COVID nineteen test for after their index stage. Next, please. For symptom outcomes, um, as you may know, those are like um, fatigue, headache, fever. Those are very common symptoms. It could happen to anyone. So we did not e exclude the people who had these symptoms before in the baseline because that means that we would ex exclude a lot of people because those symptoms are very common in clinical setting. So instead, uh, we controlled for like, who had the symptom in the baseline, for example, if our outcome is fatigue, we identify the people who develop fatigue following their index stage. And then we control the for if this person 
also had a fatigue diagnosis in the baseline. So, so this way will keep a lot of people in our sample without losing so many patients to have to have enough power. And then we for this one we use logistic regression because we did not consider the time to event. We only looked at if the person developed this, this symptom uh, following the index stage. And again, so this this was conducted for both children and adults. Uh, next, please. So results, um, overall, we included about 3 million adults aged uh, 20 years or older by the time of the, their index date uh, between March 1st, 2020 and May 31st, 2021. Uh, about 10% of them uh, we identified as positive so based on the lab tested results and the rest of them were negative. We also identified about 675,000 unique children uh, who aged below 20, and uh, around 9% of them were tested positive and the rest of, of them were negative. Next, please. So this table presents the descriptive results of each symptom or condition outcome by hospitalization status uh, and uh, the, uh, if the, if the COVID-19 testing is positive or negative. Um, so a few highlights here. So as you can see, among generally speaking, those who are hospitalized, uh, uh, they had a higher prevalence or incidence of condition of these outcomes. For example, over half adults who are hospitalized uh, with the positive test results, they developed at least one symptom, versus about 40% uh, among those who test negative. We also found that like, about 17% of hospitalized people with positive tests, uh, they developed uh, shortness of breath. Um, among condition outcomes, we found there's a big difference between positive and negative in terms of respiratory disease, like about 14% of people who hospitalized uh, uh, testing positive, they developed at least one respiratory disease versus only 7% who, who are negative. Uh, among children, we found uh, uh, about 44% of children who were hospitalized and testing positive, who, who tested positive and hospitalized, uh, developed at least one symptom condition. So those are descriptive results without any adjusting, without any adjustment. Next, please. So those are uh, adjusted analysis from regressions. Uh, we have two panels here. The upper panel uh, is for adults and the lower panel is for children or younger adults uh, aged uh, below 20. Also, as you can see, it's very consistent uh, with what we observed from the descriptive table. So among both children, uh, among adults, those who are hospitalized, uh, um, the the, those people who are tested positive, like those orange dots, those among hospitalized people, those who tested positive ha uh, had a higher odds of developing any symptom, three or more symptom, fatigue or shortness of breath. Um, as you can see, those uh, who are not hospitalized, uh, uh, a positive testing is associated with higher odds of getting fatigue or short shortness of breath. Uh, among children, as we can see, the among those hospitalized, uh, a positive COVID-19 testing was associated with higher odds of having at least one symptom or, or and shortness of breath. And interestingly, we find uh, among those who are not hospitalized, a positive test uh, was associated with lower odds or decreased odds of having three or more symptoms. So those are for the symptom outcomes. Next. <clears throat> um, for condition outcomes, such as mental health, chronic kidney disease, uh, we found a, what we found is among those who are hospitalized, a positive testing is associated with increased risk. So those are from the Cox model. So uh, they are the adjusted hazard ratio instead of odds ratio. So those who tested positive had a higher risk of developing type 1 or type 2 diabetes, uh, hematologic disorders, or respiratory disorders, uh, respiratory disease. Um, so the evidence is less, uh, it's less significant among not hospitalized people. We only find among not hospitalized people uh, positive testing is associated with increased risk of having of developing hematological disorder, and we also found uh, a positive testing is associated with 
uh, reduce the risk of some conditions. Next, please. So this is uh, what we found, but the, to summary, we found adults with a positive test were and the increased odds of being diagnosed with certain symptoms and also were at a higher risk of being newly diagnosed with certain conditions as potential PASC uh, between the 31 to 150 day time window following their test compared to those who uh, never tested positive. Uh, we also found the hospitalized children with a positive test also were at a higher odds of being diagnosed with symptoms, including shortness of breath compared to those hospitalized children with negative testing result. Next, please. Uh, generally speaking, we found the difference in symptoms and condition following a positive test, or following positive negative tests were more evident among hospitalized patients than non-hospitalized patients. Um, we also found the relative small difference in symptoms and the conditions between non-hospitalized patients who test positive and, who not, who, and those who test the negative. Next, please. So there's some implications in terms of clinical care delivery and public health. So first, uh, given the results, uh, it seems to tell us that the clinicians and the public health agents should monitor for the development and the persistence of symptoms and conditions after COVID-19 testing, especially among those who are hospitalized following a test. And also the higher burden of past symptoms conditions after COVID-19, especially among those who, with severe disease, should be should also uh, also should encourage investment in clinical public health resources to deliver care, to treat, and prevent the PASC. Next, please. So there's some, there are some limitations because this is an EHR-based analysis. I mean, uh, we only capture patient symptom conditions if they have encountered with these health systems. But in reality, people could go anywhere to receive health care. So there is a chance that we underestimate the real prevalence and incidence of these outcomes uh, among these patients. Um, uh, um, because, I mean, our data only captures uh, those health systems and the, the hospitals and the clinics affiliated with, with, with these health systems. So also, like uh, people who the people who we identified as negative, they could have a test positive test uh, at some point, like at home testing or some pharmacy that were not captured in EHR data. But this will bias the result towards none. And also, EHR data does not include the information about uh, when a person begins or terminated the relationship with health system. We only see this person had encounter in the time period. If this person uh, if we if we don't find any information on this person, it does not mean this person. Uh, they, they, we, we don't know if this person just terminated or this person is healthy without receiving health care or this person something happened like we, we did not capture. Um, for hospitalized people, I mean, uh, we we just don't know like what's the reason for their hospitalization. So it could be uh, for those hospitalized the testing negative. It could imp it could include those hospitalized for some other conditions. Next, please. Um, so this study was generously supported by CDC and of course the NIH funded recovery initiative. Uh, I think that's all I have for my part. So uh, I will turn it over to, thank you so much for your time and I'll turn it over to the next speaker. Hi, give me one second to get myself set up. All right, hello, um, thanks for joining. My name is Hanya Razaghi and I will um, be talking about the uh, work that was recently published in studying the effectiveness of um, the COVID-19 vaccine against um, long COVID in children with some sensitivity analyses and um, for COVID infection um, using the real world recovery data. Next slide. So this work was made possible by the NIH Recover Program, um, but this talk and its contents are my own and not representative of the official views of the NIH. Um, I just wanna take a moment up front to thank all patients, caregivers, and community representatives um, for their continued engagement and the support um, in all the work that we do um, in Recover to try to improve the lives of those living with long COVID. 
Next slide. So the RECOVER program has uh, four research aims in its study of uh, the post-acute sequela of COVID-19, PASC, or long COVID. Uh, these include understanding how often long-term symptoms occur and who may have higher or lower risk, why these effects of COVID-19 happen, how they impact a person's long-term health, and importantly, what we can do to prevent or treat long COVID. The work that uh, we present here deals with the last of these aims, um, specifically with understanding the role of vaccines um, that vaccines have played in preventing long COVID, uh, both from preventing infection in the first place and in then in mitigating the symptoms associated with long COVID. Next slide. It's been widely established in uh, clinical trials that children who are vaccinated have fewer infections and reduce severity in infections, um, and that there are potential waning effects over time with new variants. Large-scale epidemiologic studies have largely replicated these findings. A recent study published in the Annals of Internal Medicine, for example, showed that vaccines reduced infection and severity of infection as measured kind of in, in a four-tiered way um, in pediatric patients. However, very little is known about the effect of vaccines in protecting against long COVID, particularly in children. We do have some adult data demonstrating the uh, protective effects, um, but uh, for children, there's kind of a dearth of observational studies, um, specifically on large sample sizes. Next slide. So to fill this gap, we wish to look more closely at the vaccine effectiveness in reducing long COVID in pediatric patients in large databases. This was driven primarily by the fact that long COVID as a primary endpoint for clinical trials is difficult, given that it's a rare and poorly defined entity. Uh, we therefore decided to use a large clinical database to estimate the vaccine effect, uh, leveraging our access to the real world data on vaccines and healthcare utilization. The PCORNET Recover database comprises 40 clinical health systems in the US, and that served as the primary data to study this question. Slide. So one of the difficulties in studying the impact of vaccines on long COVID is the difficulty in defining long COVID. There are many manifestations of long COVID, and we have demonstrated in several studies that there are both syndromic features, which are kind of symptoms like fever or hair loss or chest pain, um, as well as uh, systemic features, which point to underlying diagnosed illness, such as myocarditis or kidney injury and et cetera. The data here are from a study produced a couple of years ago, uh, where we identified disease clusters that were more prominent in children with lab-confirmed COVID-19 versus those with tests negative uh, for COVID-19. So in 2022, that was possible given the general unavailability of at-home testing. Next slide. Um, so since then, we've reproduced the similar findings uh, with updated data uh, using a tree-based scan statistic as a mining tool for diagnose, uh, diagnosis codes that are more prominent in children either tested for or diagnosed with COVID-19, but then also children uh, diagnosed with long COVID. So we compared the second cohort, um, the long COVID analysis, we compared um, children with COVID-19 diagnosis, but not a long COVID diagnosis, um, compared uh, to those with a long COVID diagnosis, so that we can learn about the conditions and symptoms co-occurring with the long COVID diagnosis to kind of come up with a symptom and condi condition feature set um, associated with long COVID. So for in this example, for example, dyspnea and its related symptoms uh, we found to be highly associated with uh, long COVID diagnoses. Next slide. So based on our previous work, we developed two approaches to identifying long COVID in our database. First is a purely diagnosis-based approach where we required the presence of a long COVID diagnosis on two separate occasions in order to exclude patients who received the diagnosis as a rule out in the EHR system. However, we know that this approach uh, will underestimate true long COVID in our population and that the previous work has demonstrated that older patients and patients with respiratory symptoms are more likely to receive that diagnosis. So we developed a probable long COVID outcome as well. And so this was defined as a recurring presence of diagnosis more common after COVID-19 or co-occurring frequently with a long COVID diagnosis code clustered by symptoms or organ systems. We required the 
recurring presence of these diagnoses within a cluster in the, in the post-acute period following the COVID-19 infection. So this produced a frequency that was much closer to the prior estimates in children, about 5%. So importantly, these are uh, patients who may uh, not have recurrence of a long COVID diagnosis, but who are still suffering with new to them symptoms that are associated with long COVID. Next slide. So the disease clusters are listed here and range from symptoms such as headache and hair loss to common manifestations such as change in taste and smell or respiratory signs and symptoms or fatigue, or well, uh, as well as more acute conditions with higher short-term risk such as myocarditis or arrhythmias. These define distinct subtypes of long COVID uh, in children. A particular, a particular child can have one or more than one, and different subtypes rise and fall over time based on the phase of the pandemic. So uh, in particular, the alpha and delta period saw more cardiac symptoms, where we uh, where um, MISC was also very common then, um, but that's waned over time, and more respiratory symptoms have, have increased um, at the start of delta, but really through um, and post-Omicron. Next slide. Um, so the other challenging thing using EHR data was defining immunization. So we specifically used electronic health record data as our data source. Vaccines are captured in three ways in this data source. They can be administered at the health system, they can be patient reported, or they can be captured through a health information exchange with the, in, uh, the institution, um, like a vaccine registry. So we wanted to ensure adequate vaccine capture for the geographic regions of the hospitals we included in uh, our study. So we compared our rates to the CDC county level vaccination rates. We selected health systems with rates greater than or equal to 60% of the CDC estimate, knowing that the CDC rates may be overestimates uh, because of the, the methods of data capture. So for example, a person who received their two doses at two different places were counted twice in the CDC methodology. So as a result, um, densely populated areas may overcount patients. We uh, frequently observed in the CDC vaccination rates greater than or equal to 95% um, vaccines, uh, vaccination captures, um, which reflects an overestimate. Next slide. So to compute an immunization rate for an institution, we first found all vaccinated and unvaccinated patients in the EHR who had a visit to the health system since 2020. We mapped patients to their home county based on the census block group data that we have in um, our EHR recover program and computed a weighted average based on the concentration of visits from each county to the health system. Then we compare to the CDC county rate. Uh, the graph on the right shows the attrition of institutions after we applied our threshold for the vaccine completeness. The x-axis shows the threshold cutoff um, of the CDC rate, and the y-axis shows the number of institutions eligible for inclusion. The blue line is for analysis of the 5 to 11 age group, and the red line for the 12 to 17 age group. Um, so we cut about half of the sites, um, as you can see on the graph the at the 60% mark. Um, but um, given the different sizes of the institution, we actually were able to retain a little bit under 80% of the patients. Next slide. So uh, in our study, um, vaccine, vaccinated patients entered the cohort after their vaccine and were matched to unvaccinated patients who had a visit at the same time. We matched based on age group and time of visit uh, to ensure that kind of the secular trends of the um, of the pandemic were kind of preserved across both cohorts. Um, age groups were stratified based on the immunization availability. Uh, and then we conducted conditional logistic regression with long COVID as the primary outcome and a sensitivity analysis for any infection. We adjusted for sex, ethnicity, health system, comorbidity burden, and pre-exposure healthcare utilization. Vaccine effectiveness was measured uh, as the percent reduction in the outcome. So this shows the final attrition cohort, showing that uh, we start with a total of 4,418,148 patients uh, after ensuring suitable vaccine data and excluding ex uh, institutions that did not meet our threshold and selecting patients with adequate follow-up data, 
we ended with a total of 1,037,936 patients who were eligible for matching. The eligibility period was defined as the period of time after which vaccines became widely available. We required at least one in-person visit to the health system during the vaccine eligibility period. For the vaccinated group, this was the time of the vaccine. For the unvaccinated group, it was defined as any visit to the health system during that period. We required one contact during the baseline period, which was the 36 months prior to the vaccine um, or the visit to the health system for the non-vaccinated -vac patients, um, and one during the observation period, which uh, our primary observation period is 12 months for our primary outcome um, and six and 18 months for the sensitivity analysis that I'll cover later. So there were a total of 480,298 children in the five to 11 group and 557,638 in the 12 to 17 age group. Matching was performed in these age groups to generate the final study at cohorts. Um, one caveat to the study, we studied all children who had at least one recorded dose of vaccines uh, because it was more likely that they received a second dose elsewhere or that there was a misrecording than that they had stopped at one dose. However, we did conduct a sensitivity analysis for the children with both recorded vaccines and it replicated our primary results. Next study, the next slide. The cohort of eligible patients was drawn from across the U.S. and was similar to the overall demographics of the U.S. children. All ages from 5 to 17 years were represented, but the most frequent ages were between 9 and 15. So this table shows the pre-matched characteristics of each cohort. So interestingly, children in the vaccinated group tended to be older um, and more likely to be Hispanic. Black children and white non-Hispanic children were more likely to be in the unvaccinated group. Next slide. Vaccinated and unvaccinated children did not have major differences in the number with chronic medical conditions using the uh, pediatric medical complexity algorithm, the PMCA, as the metric to um, evaluate medical uh, complexity. Unvaccinated children had slightly more clinical visits uh, before the vaccine study entry date than vaccinated children. Before matching, vaccinated patients were more likely to be seen by clinicians earlier in the pandemic, which may be related to vaccine availability in the adolescent age group. Unvaccinated children were more likely to be seen for the first time after December 2021, which coincides with the rising acute illness of Omicron and other respiratory infections. So this pronounced difference really drove our decision to match by time period in our study um, to ensure that the secular trends didn't drive differences in outcomes between our two groups. Next slide. This graph, so results now, <laughs> this graph shows uh, vaccine effectiveness. Um, first, I'm showing the acute infection outcome. Um, infection was defined as positive antigen or PCR test or specific COVID-19 diagnosis. Follow-up uh, was 12 months. Since the 12 to 17 year olds had a vaccine available to them prior to Omicron, we computed vaccine effectiveness pre and post Omicron. So here we see that the vaccine was most effective uh, in a 12 month follow-up among adolescents and teens in the pre-Omicron era. The overall vaccine effectiveness uh, across age groups and time periods was greater than 50%. Next. So here we look specifically at effectiveness of vaccines in preventing long COVID. Overall, the vaccines demonstrate more than 35% effectiveness in preventing long COVID, defined by our probable definitions, which was our um, disease, like our condition cluster uh, definition um, across all age groups and time periods. The effect was the highest for adolescents and teenagers, particularly during and after the Omicron period. The effect was even stronger when we looked only at the patients who received a diagnosis of long COVID. It was 41.7% overall with nearly 60% effectiveness for adolescents. We performed two major sensitivity analyses on this data. First, we wanted to observe the effect of vaccines against long COVID when the vaccine was received following a prior episode of COVID-19. The sample size was too small for the diagnosed PASC, but we observed a protective effect greater than 50% in the adolescent group and an overall effect of about 48% in the full cohort. Second, we conducted a mediation analysis to examine how infection mediates the relationship between vaccine and long COVID. 
The data show that the principal mechanism for reducing long COVID is by reducing the acute risk of COVID-19 and serious infection. Next slide. This graph shows that like vaccine effectiveness on acute COVID-19, the protection uh, wanes over time for preventing long COVID. The blue represents the blue lines represent the six month follow up from vaccines, the red 12, uh, 12 months, which was our primary outcome, and the green um, 18 months. So the vaccine was most effective at six months and least effective at 18 months. The overall protective effect um, across all age groups was greater than 50% six months after immunization, where it was, whereas it was 34% at um, 12 months, which was our primary outcome, um, and not statistically significant at 18 months. So uh, some part of this observation could be due to the impact of the changing variants and how vaccines kind of target those, um, or it could be due to the waning effect of vaccines uh, over time. Next slide. So we have demonstrated that vaccines uh, studies should be done using real world data that kind of should be done to learn about the impact on preventing COVID-19 as well as long COVID. Our vaccine rates and long COVID rates have uh, replicated other studies providing face validity for our methods. Um, most importantly, we replicated findings from clinical trials showing protective effects of the vaccine against long COVID in real world data. Um, the use of this data is accessible and um, more time efficient than trying to conduct clinical trials for everything from scratch. So producing these results offers some reassurance about the validity of EHR research in studying vaccine effectiveness, um, particularly for, for uh, COVID, the pandemic. We found that our vaccines were most protective in our adolescent age group and that the protectiveness kind of wanes over time. At 12 months, we're still seeing protective effects, but statistically, statistical significance are less pronounced at 18 months. So more research is needed to understand whether this is driven primarily by changing variants or the waning protection of the mRNA vaccines. Next slide. A few limitations and caveats. First, EHR-based studies are utilization-based and therefore may be biased. So we attempted to account for this limitation in several ways, including matching our cohort, adjusting for covariates, careful selection criteria, and rigorous exposure and outcome definitions. Second, there are a lot of temporal changes, including differences in diagnosis and presentation of long COVID over the past few years. So we attempted to address this by using our previous research to define long COVID dynamically and heterogeneously. Third, uh, as discussed on previous slides, vaccine effectiveness wanes over time. Um, and finally, more phenotyping work is required to kind of understand the presentation of long COVID in younger children, um, as they're the, the group that uh, with the fewest incidences of long COVID diagnosis. So there are several next steps. First, we need to uh, implement some more methods to account for the potential of additional types of biases. Um, we should also look at mediation analysis to kind of understand the steps towards uh, long COVID vaccines and, uh, or rather the uh, protective effect of long COVID, um, of vaccines on long COVID. Um, third, the, the data we show are primarily for children who received the Pfizer BioNTech MR mRNA vaccine, um, which was approved uh, earlier for children. So comparative effectiveness by vaccine type may be of interest to community members and those impacted by long COVID. Um, we've observed in the study that vaccine following infection still offers protection against long COVID, and this will be important for future prevention efforts. Um, fourth, especially as the recover prospective uh, pediatric cohort gathers data, we'll learn how to refine our methods for identifying long COVID in EHRs and uh, reproducing these results will be required. And finally, reanalyzing the results is important to track new viral variants in clinical practice. Um, we should try to understand better what is driving the, the waning protection um, that we observed in this study. Thank you. And um, that concludes my, my presentation. All right. Thanks uh, to both our presenters. Um, uh, it's, I think they're both really great examples of how we can leverage uh, the, the current EHR data to try to look for patterns and obviously also detect uh, the potential uh, effectiveness of vaccines and potentially other therapeutics down the line. Um, 
I wanted to uh, perhaps start with one of the questions that comes up, I think, uh, pretty often, which is, you know, as we, the pandemic obviously has taken us through many phases and um, both the studies sort of highlight the challenges with doing these studies over time and comparing COVID in 2020 with 2021 and later in 2022, as we go through original Wuhan strains to alpha and delta strains uh, through to Omicron and beyond strains. And I wonder if both of you could just comment a little more on the how you accounted for that in the current work. I know, uh, Dr. Zhang, your analysis stops uh, before many of the variants emerge, um, but how you are accounting for variant emergence and sort of the changes in symptoms as you carry these studies forward. Yeah, that's a good question, very important question. <clears throat> I think in EHR data, it's very hard to select what variant this person had because we only know if the testing result is positive or negative. Um, but there's no additional information if like Omicron or Alpha or Delta. So what we did, uh, I think probably I did not present that uh, uh, in masters is to control for when this person was tested positive by the, using like a time like March, 2020, April, 2020, um, like uh, January, 2021. This could be a proxy for the variant, but not a perfect uh, because the EHR data does not have such information of, available for researchers. Yeah, so we attempted to kind of look at this by um, understanding or, or trying to encompass a wide range of um, symptoms because of the, the changing variants. Um, I mean, the, the vaccines didn't come until, you know, when it did in the in the pandemic. So especially in the 5 to 11 age group, there were a lot of kind of the MISC, for example, would not have been that much of an interest. So because of that, that was kind of excluded from um, our, our definition. So we did try to um, align kind of the time periods with the, the disease clusters um, that we, we came up with to kind of account for the differences that we see of, of presentation. And then, you know, the, the long COVID diagnosis code obviously is under, like it's it's not um, used as frequently as it should, but it, um, it does offer, you know, the added benefit of, of a clinician diagnosing and saying this patient has long COVID. Yeah. Um, one of the other things that I think comes up as we try to do these analyses, is, and both of you alluded to it, uh, is sort of the immense changes in the way people were tested uh, over time. So obviously, right in the beginning, there were no testing available. And then it became that you could really only be tested at a healthcare facility or a specialized testing location. And then it became that everyone was testing at home and now no one tests ever. Uh, and it's only if they happen to show up and they're like, oh, I have these symptoms. And then somebody says, oh, do a COVID test. And they realize they actually have COVID. And so can you just talk a little bit about how you tried to account for uh, the patient reporting or when a patient said uh, that they had a test, uh, a positive test at home and uh, and obviously some of the challenges with trying to do that? Uh, yeah, I, I can go first. Uh, so th this is a, such an important question, um, which I think uh, all the EHR-based studies have this question, like how do you know if this negative person, which you identified in EHR, are truly negative. Um, and also you, you consider like a capacity constraints we had uh, in the beginning of pandemic, anywhere in the country. I mean, there's a lot, a lot of problems with this issue. So what we did, uh, we did a few things to account for this potential bias. I mean, first uh, we did a sensitivity analysis by excluding patients who were tested in a in the early phase, like first three, uh, like March, April, May in 2020, because we know uh, during this time period, uh, it was a mess. Like the capacity, testing capacity was very limited. Uh, um, and there's no standard uh, how to code a positive test, like the diagnosis, if you consider like the physicians are using a variety of ICD-10 codes to code uh, 
this person has COVID. So with we, we thought probably the testing results and diagnosis in the early phase pandemic are uh, it's less reliable compared to later phase. So we, uh, for many of our result uh, 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 studies, we excluded the like first uh, three months pandemic in 2020, making sure. Uh, results are consistent. Uh, um, also, another thing we did to make sure uh, like the positive or true positive, negative or true negative, it's like uh, among those who tested negative, we also make sure that uh, those people did not have uh, a diagnosis suspicious as COVID. Uh, we also make sure they did not have they don't receive a therapeutic for COVID, like remdesivir or uh, some other med some other treatment uh, physicians used in the early phase of the pandemic to treat COVID. So we did a lot of this sensitivity analysis to see if the results are consistent. But again, this this issue is very hard to address. But we were able to do all kinds of analysis to make sure we did our best to address this issue. Yeah, and and for um for ours, uh, we we did require for the symptom-based um, diagnosis um, for of long COVID to have um, any kind of evidence of, of COVID-19. So that could be lab or it could be just a diagnosis code that the clinician enters. So if a patient you know, uh, was seen for COVID-19, um, regardless of testing or where or how, um, it would have been recorded. So that was our kind of attempt to do that. Of course, we're not accounting for the patients who, you know, had COVID-19, um, but didn't report it or weren't sick enough to see a clinician. Um, however, we did exclude the patients who had like a history. So if, you know, they were being seen re repeatedly for other things and they had a history of COVID-19, um, we did exclude those, those patients. Um, we did not require original kind of infection for the the diagnosed long covid group. Um thanks. The I guess I would add maybe one editorial comment for the audience which is when we think about vaccination studies of any type and impact of vaccine. I think it's really important that we think about how we try to measure that. And there are some absolute numbers that um, Dr. Razaghi talked about as far as protection against infection. But I think there's also sort of the added benefit of modifying uh, potential illness. And so Dr. Zhang's study actually, I think is a really nice example of how the potential impact of vaccine may be most important in causing a very severe illness to be more mild. And that would still count as an infection and sort of blunt the absolute response but still be a really meaningful impact of vaccine. And so I just want the audience to just keep in mind, and I know Dr. Rosaga did sort of try to couch that, but it's one of the things that as a vaccine researcher, I really try to emphasize is that sometimes the numbers themselves don't truly capture the impact of vaccine. And going from severe to even mild or moderate could have a huge impact on a patient's risk uh, of subsequently developing a long COVID. And, and while we try to account for those factors, we, we can't perfectly do it in these studies, but it's really important to sort of keep that in mind. Yeah, and I, I would add that um, even just reporting COVID-19 to your clinician. So when, we're, when we say we see increased all infection, that I think incorporates also the, like a, a, a kind of um, proxy severity because the fact that, you know, the, the patients with immunization are less likely to even pick up their phone and say, I have, you know, I have these symptoms and, and I um, have COVID-19, um, does demonstrate the both kind of infection overall, but most importantly, this to make it severe enough to just report it in the first place. Um, yeah, and obviously I think the, the point to acknowledge is that uh, in the current uh, era right now, our vaccination rates are are uh, very very low across all age groups. Uh, older uh, adults of any time kind with boosters, and certainly young kids, because the vaccine became available to them very late. Um, uh, very few of the youngest kids have been vaccinated at all with with any type of vaccine. And so again, just talking about, I think the importance and impact of this research is again trying to figure out what the protective effects are and um, and to continue to define better, particularly in children, what the impact of COVID is and what the long COVID 
uh, uh, conditions really are. And, and um, uh, let's see. Did either of you had any any comments about your counterparts uh, presentation that you wanted to make or any questions? Not to put you on the spot, but I guess I am putting you on the spot. <laughs> Yeah, I want I want I want to thank the, the study of, of explanation because I mean it's as many people know it's very it's extremely hard to capture vaccine status in the year chart data because most people get a vaccination and pharmacy not a hospital so that information is not shared with hospital in year chart data and that's why you can see most studies about the past did not control for vaccine status, unless they have very robust yet, like a VA, they probably have more comprehensive information. So I, I, I can imagine that's a very tremendous of work to uh, uh, identify the vaccine status. I mean, we are working on like a combined year chart with the state registry, which they have very comprehensive vaccination data. So I, I just want to acknowledge the effort, to, like uh, this is a very important factor to consider and uh, it's very hard. So getting this study completed, it's, it's very, it's great to inform policy and public health initiatives. Yeah, that was one of the, the biggest, um, you know, the, the, one of the, the biggest issues we had was making sure that our vaccine data was somewhat reliable. Um, and so, you know, we we actually surveyed the sites and asked who is getting the health information exchange. And we did this whole data quality analysis. We're actually going to publish that paper um, as well to kind of make it more widely available and known. Um, but, you know, we there, you know, we tested for uh, association between those institutions who say, yes, we we participate in a health information exchange with the vaccine registry and, you know, the the more accurate uh, measures. So um, that that was a, a thing that we had to spend a lot of um, uh, time on. Um, I do have a question also for um, for Dr. Zhang. Um, I'm curious how you disentangled kind of long COVID from prior conditions and patients with kind of medical complexity in, in your study. Yeah, that's a very good question. So for condition outcomes like mental health, diabetes, chronic kidney disease, um, we looked at the new, newly diagnosed conditions. It's like we made sure there, there was no diagnosis for this condition prior to COVID testing. Like in this baseline, one month to 18 months period, uh, we made sure this person did not have any diagnosis for diabetes. And if we observe a newly diagnosed uh, and a uh, condition, and if the if the newly diagnosed diabetes is much higher among positive versus negative, we can consider that a pass because we never know which one's pass. We it's it's like we we that's much more likely to be a pass if we see a newly diagnosed diabetes much much higher incident among positive compared to negative. I, I think it's hard to disentangle for symptom conditions because fatigue. Uh, shortness, breath, headache, those are very common symptoms. It could, could happen to anyone for any condition. Um, and also, as, as you may know, EHR data probably does a poor job of capturing symptom compared to capturing conditions because many physicians probably don't bother to code that in the EHR. A headache, if that's minor, but never recorded in the EHR data. So this is probably harder to disentangle uh, ascertain compared to conditions. What we did is we just look at the who had a headache after testing, and okay, if this person also had a headache before, which would be very reasonable for some other conditions, we just control the for the prior headache. I think that's what we can do, and the most for the symptom conditions. Yeah. So yeah. Um, I guess one of the points that I would add before we transition to the QA, and this is, uh, I guess, perhaps a question opposed to both of you is, you know, I think obviously the EHR strength is identifying those new conditions, but how do you try to account for patients who, let's say, had existing anxiety or depression that was managed uh, perhaps with counseling or without medication, but post-COVID becomes severe enough or is exacerbated where they need medication or further therapy or become recalcitrant? You could say the same thing about patients with diabetes or kidney disease or the like. Can you just talk about some of the challenges in trying to account for that, some of the ways you try to address that, and perhaps some of the ways you're looking at that going forward? Yeah, that's a good question. So, I mean, uh, the 
has could be defined as newly diagnosed condition or exacerbation of pre-existing conditions. So we, so we started to a deep, a dive deep, uh, have a look, look into this question. So we started with diabetes, for example. Uh, so we looked at people who had a type 2 diabetes before pandemic and uh, defined a few indicators that may be that may potential that, that, that potentially indicate exacerbation of type 2 diabetes, such as elevated HbA1c test testing results, like from uh, well controlled to poorly controlled uh, based on the testing results, increased uh, use of anti uh, anti diabetic medication like only one medication class become two or more. And also, um, so we started looking into questions with starting with diabetes because diabetes outcomes are easier to define based on yet mm -hmm. because you have labs, you have medication prescription. For uh, depression, anxiety, I think that will leverage some like uh, questionnaire scales. I mean, people will answer questions. So it's a little bit harder to do with EHR data alone. You have, we have to combine EHR with some other data. Of course, we can look at the prescription. So the, the, the uh, for people with mental health conditions, we, we can look at if there are any change in terms of medication use before and after COVID testing. So that could be something we, uh, we, we should explore in the future. But that is a very important question, not only newly diagnosed condition, but also the exacerbation of prior conditions after COVID. Yeah, um, so this is a very difficult question and disease exacerbation. So there's a couple of ways um, to think about it. So we have been doing, and you know, the, this was a kind of different study, but we've been doing kind of disease focused um, analyses kind of, we did uh, one on type one diabetes, for example, um, showing kind of how the A1C does actually get a little bit worse, uh, but then normalizes over time for most patients um, after COVID-19. So, uh, and then um, we are currently doing one on sickle cell. And so there, there's a certain kind of uh, conditions that we are doing deep dives on to, to look at this. For kind of these large scale um, analyses, what we do is we have a washout period, so we don't say completely new to the patient, but, you know, for example, if, if they weren't seen for six months for their depression because they were handling it okay, or their, um, you know, whatever condition it was, but then we see a new, new utilization, we will say that that is uh, still counting. It, it, it's likely potentially a, a exacerbation. So that's the way that we kind of attempted to, to balance um, the, the question about the, um, the exacerbation. All right. Thanks to both of you. All right. I'm going to hand it back to Dr. Linus to take us through the audience submitted questions. Thanks, Dr. Jafari. Hey, everyone. I'm going to run through some of the questions. And again, the, those that we don't get to, we'll try to answer, um, and they'll be on the website. So I think the first question I'll start with is came as a pre-question before this, um, um, talk today, and it was uh, to ask is please discuss successes and barriers to obtaining info from EHRs for research and comment on strategies for interinstitutional data sharing. And that's to both speakers. Uh, I, I, I have to start first. Um, so yeah, this is this 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 is uh, definitely a challenge. I mean, if you consider like New York City, we have such a fragmented market. We have so many big hospitals in New York City, like Cornell, Mount Sinai, NYU, Columbia, Montefiore, or five major ones uh, in Manhattan, I guess only, and not not to mention like Long Island. Yeah. So people go anywhere. So I mean, for researchers, we would like to capture the comprehensive information as much as possible to so track patients across different institutions to have a like whole personal information, full picture. Um, that, that means that only using one hospital data is not complete. You miss lots of information about the positive testing, medication use, diagnosis. Uh, so we leverage this coordinate framework. So if if hospitals are members of this network, um, they, are, they are able to track the same patient across different hospitals. Uh, so which we have much better, much comprehensive information for each person in our data. Of course, I mean, because many people could also use healthcare in some other hospital, not, not members of this network. In that case, we were not able, we will not be able to capture the information happen outside this network. Um, 
and something else to we have been considering, uh, for example, using claims data, which uh, will be much comprehensive, but you don't have lab or some other data from claims. So I don't think there's an answer for this question. I think for each project, we just identify the key data elements we need for this research question and uh, do our best to combine data from different sources uh, to for the more for most reliable, most robust possible data for the question. So I'll pass it to uh, Doctor uh, for your discussion. Yeah. Uh, so EHR data is is very challenging. Um, so um, the part of the the way I, we we can't get around it, right? There's the the EHR data. Um, creates what we call kind of collider bias in terms of who gets healthcare, um, and therefore we're already starting out with bias. So given that um, kind of one, we try to um, really account for that in the analyses that we do. So uh, making sure that you know uh, certain that that the two cohorts where we are looking for differences in effect um, are similar enough. Uh, or are you know are comparable um, so that we can um, draw on observations from from the data that we have. Um, while there are you know so so there's you know like the the utilization bias. There's what gets recorded and all of these things. And so in addition to kind of accounting these like kind of accounting for these statistically, we try to kind of do uh, what we call study specific data quality analysis to kind of understand. The extent of the data, of the the bias that we're dealing with, or how diagnosis codes are um, represented or not represented across different institutions, you know, are they using things a little bit differently to represent the same idea? So we we really try to kind of um, mitigate the these kinds of biases by by doing spending a lot of time up front um, evaluating the the different kinds of biases and and what what we can do to to address them. Great, thank you so much. Uh, I think the next question I'm gonna send to Dr. Rosagi, um, it's the, the question's pretty long, but it says with the burgeoning number of research studies being done on long COVID, I wonder if it would be helpful for the research community to communicate to clinicians to code for long COVID in the EHR. I have had classic long COVID for over a year and have encouraged my PCP to code for it in part to assist any future research done using UHRs. Uh, she has not given me the diagnosis, however, as she states there's no diagnosis despite there existing quite a few codes for it. I wonder how many clinicians feel this way and, and the effect it could have on many things, including on research. Yes, and that's a, a really great observation because you can only um, study something if it's recorded. <laughs> um, so, so that's why we are, you know, we we try to come up with um, these data mining techniques to understand what is occurring more frequently in these groups, um, and then generalize it to a larger uh, population so that we can um, kind of overcome these these barriers. I think that clinician outreach has to be a really, you know, an, an important part of of what we do, and within our health systems. Um, feeding back kind of this this learning health system model where we uh, provide information back to clinicians. A lot of clinicians, I bet, you know, if you look at your notes, at the um, clinician notes, they uh, probably mention long COVID. So as part of the recover um, program, what we're doing now is going through and extracting from cl uh, clinician notes um, observations about patients that we can't get just by the structured data. So we're trying to kind of get inside the mind of the clinician, um, whether or not they they diagnose officially in, in the EHR. Great, thank you. This question will be for both of you. There was actually several questions around the same topic, so I'm just gonna read one, but um, it speaks to several comments. Um, our 14 year old daughter was a long hauler for over a year. Her main and most debilitating symptom is anxiety and suicidal depression. It's such a common symptom among all long haulers. Why was this system, symptom not included in the probable diagnosis disease cluster slide? With all due respect, if you do not look very closely at mental health problems caused by even mild acute COVID infection, you're missing the mark. Yeah, I first um, just want to acknowledge um, you know the that that sounds like a very painful experience, and I'm I'm sorry um, for that. Um, so 
I, I felt it was important to address this, or I, I do feel it's very important to address this question. So the the mental health impact, um, <clears throat> so we there was a cluster for um, effective cognitive functioning. So as mental health impacts um, functioning, we were hoping that those were captured um, because they were occurring more frequently. Um, and then two other things. So <clears throat> when we do these analyses, what what we've also noticed outside of um, kids who were diagnosed with COVID-19 was uh, the large rise um, of mental health issues um, just from the, the social impact of the pandemic in general. And so this was kind of very difficult to um, disentangle from the direct impacts of COVID in general. So, um, so a lot of these signals actually were not um, prominent when we were comparing across the groups. However, that doesn't mean that it's not real. So as I mentioned in my um, previous um, question about the notes, one of, and, and the kind of um, specific disease or like kind of condition focused um, exacerbation is that uh, we are trying to make mental health a priority um, in terms of looking at, um, you know, given its um, impact and, and the way that the social impacts of the pandemic have also um, made it difficult to disentangle, a, a deeper dive is kind of warranted into, into this. And so uh, we're doing that and also with the clinical, the clinician notes, using one of these features, using mental health features um, as well to kind of extract from clinical notes what's what's going on a little bit better. So that that is um, a limitation of of the way that we've um, that we were kind of forced to to uh, demarcate these these uh, and label these um, probable conditions. So thank you for asking that and and describing your experience. Um, can I just jump in for just one sec? Oh, I, sure. I do want us to you know, we have spent this session talking about uh, electronic health record studies and some of the advantages, but also some of the disadvantages. Um, it is important to remember that recover is many things as I talked about at the beginning. And one of the specific advantages of some of the prospective studies is to be able to ask some of these questions in a more detailed way or in a different way to try to account for some of the shortcomings of ex relying exclusively on EHR-based research or on lab-based research or the like. So, so thinking about the, the comprehensive nature of what the Recover initiative is trying to do uh, is really important. And um, the, the whole initiative is trying to come at it from different directions. Great, thank you for the reminder. Dr. Zane, do you have any comment or do you, I can go on to the next question? I can go to the next one. Okay, great. So that, I'm going to send it to you, actually. Um, the question is, when controlling for mechanical ventilation, did you also test for the effect of the number of MV days on COVID diagnosis? I'm thinking this should have been significant. And there's a second question from someone else very similar that says, rather than just control for MV days, I hope you can test for the effect of MV days on long COVID diagnosis as well, as well as on variables such as RDW. I'm sorry, my connection was not stable, so I, I missed the first part of what you oh, said. So what, the, the first question, question about... is, when, con when controlling for mechanical ventilation, did you also test for the effect of the number of MV days on COVID diagnosis? Yeah, that's, that's a very good question. Um, I think the tricky part is that uh, um, in the EHR data, we only observe like who had a mechanical ventilation based on the procedure code. Like, okay, this, this is like all the EHR data we have for this hospital encounter. And we look, we, okay, we, we observe a procedure code, a HIPAA code, ICD-9 procedure code, ICD-10 procedure code for mechanical ventilation. We know this person had this mechanical ventilation. It's, it's very hard for us to count how many days this person used the mechanical ventilation because, I mean, I don't think EHR data has like a per day record. We only know like what happened during the encounter all the medications, all the diagnosis, all the procedures without knowing like, okay, probably this, this procedure repeated five days. So it's, it's, it's hard to capture the EHR data, but, but I agree with that uh, it, it's a very important thing to consider. Great, thank you. 
So another question for both of you. Um, have symptoms of long COVID been observed to worsen or reemerge following a non-COVID infection or due to other triggering factors? If so, what are these triggers? Um, we haven't looked at it into this, but I would think if you think about like uh, other hardship everyone experienced during pandemic, uh, social isolation, for example, which all of us experienced regardless of our COVID status, uh, especially during like the first year pandemic, uh, that could exacerbate everyone's mental health status, regardless of if you were positive or negative. And if you think about like unemployment, people experienced uh, in 2020, food access, and you don't have access to healthcare uh, for elective purpose. So all this uh, hardship we experienced could exacerbate a lot of conditions, even for people who were COVID negative at that time. So um, that's, that's what I think. So do you mind repeating the question? I wanna make sure I, I address the question asked. Sure. Have symptoms of long COVID been observed to worsen or reemerge following a non-COVID infection or to other triggering factors? If so, what are the what are these fact triggers? Excuse me. Yeah, so we haven't done a lot of um, research into this. I will say right now, um, one of the things that we are looking at is um, the effect of subsequent infections on um, after initial COVID-19 infection. So for example, if you look at um, children with COVID-19 and a, a, another respiratory illness is both the frequency and the severity and the types of illness, for example, RSV, um, is it more severe um, after initial infection? So we're actually currently un, um, doing this analysis and, and um, don't have any preliminary results yet to show, but this is something that as the pandemic goes on, we are trying to understand how COVID-19 is or is not different than other respiratory infections. Um, so this, I think, is going to be an important question about kind of what triggers long COVID, what triggers uh, vulnerability to subsequent infections, um, and, and things like that. So thanks for asking this question. It's, it's an important one. Great, thanks. And another one for both of you, or if one wants to take it. Um, do we know the effects acute and long-term of administrating mRNA and non-mRNA vaccine on patients who are present who are presently with long COVID? Is there an exacerbation of symptoms? Um, so what we have observed is that if you get a vaccine after long or after initial infection, you are protected from long COVID. But I think the question is asking if you currently have long COVID, what will happen if you get the um, vaccine? And that is actually that we have not um, yet studied that. Um, so I, I don't I don't think we have any data to back that up. I, I will say that anecdotally, there have been um, reports that there's been improvement of symptoms after um, the administration of, of the vaccine, um, but we have not specifically looked at this question. I would also just add, I think that um, there are so few individuals who have gotten the protein vaccine the, that uh, the, the uh, question, the submitter of the question is asking that it's really hard to denote any specific effects of that. So obviously we have millions upon millions of people who have gotten the mRNA vaccine and, and many, many, many fewer who have gotten the, the Novavax uh, protein uh, vaccine. So it's really hard to know other than the general protection level uh, that it offers. Uh, we don't really have uh, the data yet for sort of the downstream uh, benefits. Well, thank you so much for responding to so many questions. We really appreciate it. We're gonna wrap it up here. Thank you so much to our presenters and thank you to our audience for attending the seminar and engaging with the Q&A. As a reminder, a recording of today's seminar will be available on recovercovid.org within a few weeks. We will also be posting a Q&A document that has responses to the questions we received today, including some that we did not have time to address. Information about future R3 seminars will be posted on the Recover website. We have some exciting topics coming up and hope to see you at future sessions. Additionally, you'll see a short survey come up on your screen, which asks for your feedback on this seminar. 
We would appreciate if you could take a, a minute to fill out this brief survey. Thank you so much and have a great day.